Tonight's speaker is Tanya Sheehan, and she's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Art at Colby College, where she teaches American and African American art history. She is the author of Doctored, The Medicine of Photography in 19th Century America. Her edited books include Photography, History, and Difference, and Photography and Its Origins. Professor Sheehan has recently contributed essays to The Image of the Black in Western Art, a series, and the edited volume, A Companion to American Art, and the journal, American Art. As a research associate at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, she is completing a book that explores ideas about race in American visual humor. Professor Sheehan currently serves as an editor of the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art Journal and organizes the Photography and Migration Project based at Colby College. Professor Sheehan's lecture tonight is entitled A Matter of Public Health, Black Doctors and Free Clinics in the Art of Jacob Lawrence. Between the 1930s and the 1950s, African-American modernist Jacob Lawrence explored through his artwork questions about public health and medical care in urban America. Lawrence's images of black doctors ask who could treat the sick, as well as how and where such care should be provided. His paintings of crowded waiting rooms and free clinics moreover forced viewers to interrogate the freedom that such spaces both promised and denied, especially in predominantly black neighborhoods like Harlem. This lecture features Lawrence's lifelong concerns with the themes of community, mobility, and the human condition. It shows how and why Lawrence's medical subjects brought the social realities of public health into American modernism. Please welcome Professor Tanya Sheehan. I was absolutely thrilled to get this invitation um, when it came in earlier this year. Um, it, it asked me, it, it mentioned, you know, Judy mentioned that she liked the work that I had done on Jacob Lawrence in the journal American Art. And she said, perhaps you might revisit some of that work or related work, and could you possibly also talk about some objects in the collection? <laughs> and at first I thought, no. <laughs> And then I thought, yes, yes, actually I can, because I've been thinking about a work in the Art Institute of Chicago's collection for some time by Jacob Lawrence. That's the first image that I'm going to show you tonight. And I've been thinking about Lawrence in relation to medicine and public health for many years, because I teach a course at Colby on medicine and visual culture. And I've always taught Lawrence in the context of that course. And thinking about Lawrence in relation to medicine is something that scholars have not done before. So I thought this is a wonderful opportunity and thank you for forcing me to produce some new research and share it with all of you. So please forgive the rawness of some of this material, but it's also a great opportunity to get feedback from this audience about this new work. So with that said, we will begin. In 1937, when he was just 20 years old, the African-American artist Jacob Lawrence made this small painting in gouache. And this is the work from the Art Institute. Its subject was one he had experienced firsthand, a free outpatient clinic at Harlem Hospital on Lenox Avenue and West 136th Street, just six blocks from his home. This early painting demonstrates characteristics that would come to define the large body of work Lawrence produced in the following decades work that depicted the ordinary lives of Harlem's predominantly black inhabitants. Free Clinic, which is the title of this work, renders bodies as abstracted shapes with flat blocks of color defining their features. Lawrence worked hard to differentiate each black body from the next, creating a variety of skin tones with shades of brown and distinguishing individuals through their dress, expressions, and attributes. Those same details form patterns across the composition, and I hope you'll just let your eyes run over the screen while I speak. Four of the figures, for instance, have bandaged faces or feet. Two of them hold bundled babies, and at least seven walk with the aid of a crutch. 
The repetition of yellow, red, black, and gray throughout the artwork lends further coherence to the crowd. Lawrence thus presents us with a diverse yet unified population, one that anticipates the images of the Great Migration he famously painted in 1940 and 1941. As in Free Clinic, the Black Bodies and Lawrence's Migration of the Negro series are constantly waiting to move. There is some ambivalence about what it means to anticipate action in these works, to constantly wait to move, whether the boarding, whether that action be the boarding of a northbound train or the receipt of medical care. In Free Clinic, we can equate such anticipation with community, cooperation, and hope. Several of the figures embrace or physically support one another, and many feature soft smiles. Some objects point to the presence of Christian faith in, in the face of sickness and injury, including the large cross around the neck of a figure holding a baby and the cross-like forms of the crutches. And I'm going to be speaking for a moment about this figure right here in red. The faces surrounding that figure at the same time express physical distress and emotional anguish. This is where the ambivalence comes in, setting the stage for a different story about the loss of faith and the failures of the free clinic. And let's not forget about the two figures with light pink flesh tones, the nurse with a notepad at center, and the orderly or policeman stationed at the doorway on the left. These white bodies control the movement in the clinic. It is their decision making and not faith alone that will ultimately determine who will be healed and when. Lawrence's vision of white authorities controlling medicalized black bodies thus invites critical commentary on healthcare in Harlem. Where, we might wonder, is the freedom in this clinic? Free Clinic was the first of many paintings by Jacob Lawrence that posed such a question to viewers, exploring the racial politics of American medicine and public health. As I've said, scholars have had little to say about this theme in the artist's work, despite the frequency with which it occurred between 1937 and the 1950s. Today, I want to return to memory Lawrence's significant investment in medicine and public health, not merely to fill out our understanding of his oeuvre, but to demonstrate how important access to and participation in medical care was for American artists in the wake of the Harlem Renaissance. Lawrence was a child of that Renaissance. For him, two medical subjects encapsulated contemporary struggles for black political agency and socioeconomic well-being more than any other. The first, the free clinic, and the second, the black doctor. To understand those subjects in his work, we must begin by considering the site of Lawrence's free clinic, namely, Harlem Hospital. In 1937, Harlem Hospital was teeming with artists who were busy painting murals in both its old and newly constructed wings. They were working for the Federal Art Project of the Works Progress Administration under the supervision of artist Charles Alston. Alston's appointment by the FAP in 1936 was historic as he became the first African-American to hold such a leadership position. He selected many of the artists for his team from the WPA Art Center he organized at 306 West 141st Street in Harlem, simply known as 306. This photograph was taken in 1933 by two men who assisted with the hospital murals, Marvin and Morgan Smith. In the back row, we see Alston, in a white shirt, standing next to Virtus Hayes, who was responsible for creating an eight-panel mural in the new nurse's residence, and we'll be looking at that shortly. On the right are three of the female master artists who were hired for the project, and this was a remarkable feature of Alston's team, was that there were so many women involved, and their names here are Elba, Elba Lightfoot, Selma Day, and Georgette Seabrook. Gwendolyn Knight, who worked with Alston on a mural for the children's ward and went on to marry Jacob Lawrence, appears on the far left. And this is, in fact, 
the moment when they first met. Lawrence had known Alston since he first moved to Harlem in 1930 at the age of 13, and when Lawrence enrolled in an after-school program where Alston was teaching art classes. By the time Alston's team was painting at Harlem Hospital, the young artist had established a workspace at his teacher's art center. But he was unable to serve as either a master artist or an official team assistant on the project for one bureaucratic reason. The WPA required its workers to be at least 21 years of age, and Lawrence was only 19. That requirement, however, did not stop Lawrence from watching Alston work on the murals, nor did it stop him from contributing to the project at the hospital in myriad ways that are undocumented by archival records. We don't have records, in other words, that tell us precisely how Lawrence contributed to the work at the Harlem Hospital or how he felt about his time there. I therefore look for Lawrence's connections to the project elsewhere, in his artwork, in the murals themselves, and in their shared participation in a period discourse on public health. Alston was the lead artist on the two best murals, best known, best known, they are the best, but they're the best known murals. Uh, <laughs> Magic in Medicine on the right and Modern Medicine on the left. Each 17 by nine foot oil painting was created for display in the lobby of the new women's pavilion, just as you see here. Together the murals contrasted two visions of medicine, traditional healing in Africa and modern medicine practiced in American hospitals. And I'd like to spend a little time with these murals. Um, I hope you can see some of the details. I'll use the laser pointer to help. So this is magic in medicine, and it's a composition full of black bodies and dominated by a Fong reliquary statue, symbolic of an African past. For the people of Gabon, this ritual object guarded the relics of ancestors, and villages would consult it before taking any significant actions, and some of those actions would, inc would include curing the sick. In the mural, figures dance around the oversized statue, while a row of masked figures and antlers, antlered animals further suggest ritual. And I'm referring here to the statue. These are the dancers surrounding it. These are those antlered animals. And you can't see this very well, but these are the masked figures behind them. They're on both sides. The lower portion of the painting contains two scenes of healing and references to the African diaspora. On the left is a representation of the American South that includes a slave cabin right here, representations of cotton plants, and a healer administering to the sick. On the right side of the mural is another healer in white robes right there. And this one's standing before a modern cityscape that's evocative of Harlem. Beside him, a traditional object associated with healing, which is an orb, right there, sits beside an apparently modern source of knowledge about the body and spirit, namely bound books. Alston was careful to create linkages between the different scenes in the composition, while ensuring viewers would appreciate that rational Western traditions were slowly and justly replacing superstition and belief as the basis for restoring health. A narrative of progress continues to unfold in modern medicine, one in which African cultural practices appear to be the stuff of the past. At the top, a small rendering of the Parthenon, it's right there, appears beside a much larger classical icon, a statue of Aesculapius, the Greek god of medicine and healing. This looming figure stands in for the Fung statue, its closed lids replaced by the open eyes of a gigantic microscope around which Alston placed men of Western science, not primitive dancers. In a similar gesture, the animals and drums from magic and medicine are relegated to the edge of the canvas. The bottom half of the mural paints a picture of Harlem Hospital in the 1930s as a space where black doctors and nurses work in harmony with their white peers, conducting surgery, performing laboratory work, caring for newborns, and lecturing to the next generation of medical professionals. 
The white medical scrubs worn by these men and women bring to mind the white robes of the traditional healer in magic and medicine, as does the arm gesture of the lecturing black doctor in the lower left. And I'm referring to the conversation between this gesture and these gestures here. According to Alston's vision of social progress, the clear way forward for African Americans is through modern science and its values. That is, rationality, objectivity, and expertise. The authority of medical professionals is essential to such progress, as is the minimization of the patient's role in the healing process. And so in the surgery, surgery scene at left, we see only the surgeons in scrubs hovering over an invisible patient. Let's now return to Jacob Lawrence's contemporaneous painting, Free Clinic, and begin to read its imagery and themes in relation to those explored by his mentor, Charles Alston. Undoubtedly, Lawrence was thinking through Alston's murals, combining elements of each into a novel composition. We can see, for example, the emphasis on faith and feeling explored in magic and medicine, articulated in free clinics crowd of waiting patients. We also see in Lawrence's gouache a representation of medical science and its technology rendered in the same cool tones found in modern medicine. And that's not being articulated in the, in the colors on the screen, but you can take my word for it that he uses the same color palette that Alston used in modern medicine. Like the statue of Aesculapius in the wide-eyed microscope in Alston's mural, the colorless outlines of beakers and bell jars lofted above the patients in free clinic corroborate the authority of Louis Pasteur and the other white men who laid the foundations for modern health care. In Free Clinic, however, Lawrence struggles to imagine white authority as a benevolent force. He clearly distinguishes his two white figures from the multitude of black bodies in the scene, highlighting their roles as gatekeepers in the clinic. Lawrence's subtle critique of white authority recalls, in fact, the lower right of modern medicine, where Alston placed two white hospital administrators. One stands erect, making an oratory gesture, while placing his other hand on the shoulder of a second man, the only person in the scene who appears to be listening to his message. The inclusion of these men in modern medicine acknowledges the controversy that engulfed the Harlem Hospital mural project from its beginnings. In February 1936, the hospital's white superintendent had rejected sketches for the murals, writing to Alston that they contained altogether, quote, too much Negro subject matter, unquote. He objected to the proposed depiction of Harlem Hospital as a, quote, black institution and New York as a black city, refusing to accept that Harlem was and would continue to be predominantly African American. Most of the murals Alston planned for the project were indeed populated solely by black subjects. Modern medicine was also not the only painting in, uh, to imagine Harlem Hospital in the 1930s as full of African-American doctors, nurses, and lab technicians. Virtus Hayes' mural cycle in the corridor of the nurses' residence, seen here, included a panel featuring an all-black medical team. This was Hayes' effort to incorporate African-Americans into the American dream and to associate blackness with expertise, industriousness, and social progress. The mural on the screen was one of the few that hospital admin, the hospital administration did not object to for reasons that should be immediately apparent to you. In a letter protesting the rejection of the mural sketches, Alston observed that the designs for the medical boardroom, including this one, quote, being executed by white artists and containing no colored figures have been readily approved. Obviously, the predominance of white subject matter in a hospital located in a predominantly Negro community causes you no concern, unquote. That was Alston speaking. The master artist overseeing the work in the boardroom was Italian-American painter Alfred Creamy, 
the only white artist in Alston's core team at Harlem Hospital. Create, to create his 25-foot fresco, titled Modern Surgery and Anesthesia, Creamy studied medical equipment and live surgeries at Kings County Hospital. The objects and actions he depicted may have been informed by his firsthand observation, but the bodies in the fresco lack physical differentiation and thus appear to the viewer as replicated types rather than carefully studied individuals. In this regard, they're quite unlike the figures in Lawrence's free clinic, which the artist was so careful to differentiate. Each of Creamy's figures is identically dressed in white scrubs and surgical masks, above which appear almond-shaped eyes. With the exception of the muscular male figure in the foreground, they all wear shiny black surgical gloves and focus on the operation at hand, carefully concealed under a white sheet. Indeed, blackness appears to be relegated to things rather than to live bodies, to the surgical gloves and instruments and the x-ray in the background. These formal choices and the high praise they received from the hospital's superintendent show us how difficult it was for African Americans in 1936 to picture themselves in the history of medicine and to portray medical authority as anything other than purely white. Alston responded to that state of affairs in the modern medicine mural by envisioning a racially integrated Harlem hospital in which black men and women adopt leadership positions. At the center of the canvas, he placed his future wife, Myra Logan, a hospital intern at the time who would go on to become a celebrated heart surgeon. But the most dynamic and arguably the most historically significant figure in the painting is the surgeon with his arm outstretched toward Logan. And Alston tells us that this figure was modeled specifically on Dr. Lewis T. Wright. A graduate of Harvard Medical School, Wright became the first black man to be appointed to the medical staff of a New York hospital, the first to be made director of a department in a non-segregated non municipal hospital, and the first to serve as president of a medical board of such a hospital. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Wright worked tirelessly to integrate New York hospitals and did so with much success. In 1938, just one year after Jacob Lawrence painted Free Clinic, Life magazine described Wright as, quote, the most eminent Negro doctor in the United States, unquote. It was thus fitting that Alston, who counted Wright as a close friend, chose him as a model for the doctor in modern medicine, passing his wisdom onto the next generation of black medical professionals. In the figure of Wright, we might also see a self-portrait of Alston, another significant first in the context of the WPA, teaching Jacob Lawrence and a team of young black artists how to represent black agency and progress. Ooh, there was my detail. <laughs> Okay. Just as the Harlem Hospital project drew to a close, Lawrence created the 60 tempera paintings for which he is now best known. The Migration of the Negro series points to the social and economic factors that motivated countless black families from the American South to move to industrialized cities in the North between World War I and the 1930s. Lawrence understood their motivations well having been born in New Jersey in 1917 to a domestic worker from Virginia and a railroad cook from South Carolina who had migrated in search of better work and living conditions. He also understood well that what black families found in the North was not unfettered opportunity, equality, and freedom because the support that Lawrence's mother received from settlement houses in Philadelphia could not fully sustain their family. So she placed her children, including Lawrence, in foster care for three years before they joined her in Harlem in 1930. The captions accompanying the panels in the migration series speak to Lawrence's personal experiences by expressing both positive and negative views of life in the North. On the one hand, they note better living conditions and education, opportunities for employment in the steel and railroad industries, the freedom to vote, and the support of the black church. 
but at the same time, they describe poor living and working conditions, extreme poverty and overcrowding, racial discrimination and violence, widespread disease, and unequal access to health care and other social services. Two panels at the end of the series comment most directly on the relationship between the Great Migration and public health. Panel 55 depicts three pallbearers with bowed heads carrying a coffin. The caption explains, quote, the Negro being suddenly moved out of doors and cramped into urban life contracted a great deal of tuberculosis. Because of this, the death rate was very high, unquote. Lawrence's choice of tuberculosis as the cause of death was well considered. For at the height of the Great Migration, African Americans in New York died of TB at a rate three times that of the white population. While the disease, when it was known as consumption, had been associated with Victorian upper-class women, popular views of TB in the US underwent radical changes in the early 20th century. By the 1920s, tuberculosis had become a social stigma attached to poor immigrants and non-whites, confirming their so-called racial inferiority and susceptibility to debilitation. The African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois forcefully countered this view in 1933 on the pages of The Crisis, the official journal of the NAACP. He argued, quote, the susceptibility of Negroes to tuberculosis and also the fact that the disease is not hereditary as we used to think shows not any lack of racial resistance, but the result of people who are poor and live in poor surroundings. Louis T. Wright, who Alston featured in Modern Medicine, extended Du Bois' observations in 1935, again in an essay for the crisis. Tuberculosis, Wright claimed, was the leading cause of illness and death among African Americans. Its cause, moreover, was the racism that led blacks to live in poverty and with access only to understaffed and poorly equipped medical facilities. Such racism led most public health officials and foundations to neglect what he called the health of one-tenth of America's total population, except in cases when its diseases were seen as a threat to white native-born Americans. Wright further proposed a link between high tuberculosis rates in the African-American community and the many obstacles to success that black doctors experienced in the medical profession. Readers of the crisis would have known Wright was speaking, in this case, from personal experience. Although he graduated fourth in his class at Harvard Medical School and ran the surgical wards at a French field hospital during World War I, he was unable to secure an internship or permanent position in Boston's white-dominated public health system. As he put it in the crisis, quote, as long as race attitudes or any other factors place a distinction between Negroes and whites, the medical achievement and the health of members of the group will be interrelated, unquote. Jacob Lawrence's migration series reinforces the relationship that Wright predicted between the health and medical achievements of African Americans. In panel 56, immediately following the tuberculosis death, Lawrence portrays a black doctor applying a stethoscope to the body of a black patient. The caption explains, quote, among one of the last groups to leave the South was the Negro professional who was forced to follow his clientele to make a living, unquote. These words evoke an important detail in Wright's biography. After completing a medical residency in, an, in the all-black Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C., which is now Howard University Hospital, Wright opened a small general practice in Harlem that catered chiefly to black patients. Even when he was appointed to the Harlem Hospital staff in 1919, he was assigned an entry-level job in the women's outpatient clinic, one that in no way acknowledged his considerable achievements in medicine. That Lawrence had right in mind when he created panels 55 and 56 is further suggested, su suggested by the doctor's own hospitalization for tuberculosis between 1939 and 1942, precisely as Lawrence was creating the migration series. Wright's body was thus ravaged by the very disease whose clinical and social origins he had studied for decades and about which he aimed to re-educate re the American public. 
It was also in 1943 that Jacob Lawrence returned to the outpatient clinic of Harlem Hospital as the subject of his art. There are many resonances between this gouache painting and Free Clinic of 1937, including the repeated forms of bandaged faces, crutches, and bundled babies. The lengthy title of this work, Harlem Hospital's Free Clinic is crowded with patients every morning and evening, further shares the earlier painting's emphasis on the sheer number of bodies seeking medical attention. And yet, in this version of the clinic, there are no figures of white authority controlling who moves into and out of the space, no cold scientific apparatus looming above the crowd. Instead, the patients wait on benches that resemble church pews, a large window offering them welcome sunlight and a heavenly blue sky. In the foreground, a pregnant figure in yellow sits apart from the masses, evocative of a black Madonna. The most significant difference between Lawrence's two depictions of the Harlem Hospital Clinic, however, is evident on the right side of the painting. There he positions a black doctor in white medical scrubs, seated on a stool as he attends to a black patient. The dark partition and white curtain that uh, tell us that the examin examination area is a private space, an important detail at a time when patient privacy and safety were regularly disregarded in Harlem's outpatient clinics and the waiting crowds forced to watch gruesome medical procedures. Lawrence also ensures that we see the black doctor taking an active and empathetic interest in the ailments of his patient. There appears, in fact, to be no instruments mediating their encounter, not even the stethoscope splayed out on the table. Instead, the doctor uses his eyes, his hands, and his heart to read the body before him, the expression on his face suggesting this may be a grave case indeed. While overall the crowding of Harlem's hospital, Harlem Hospital's free clinic encourages viewers to be concerned about the physical and social well-being of the black community, the inclusion of the scene on the right recognizes the significant achievements of Louis T. Wright and his peers, achievements that they argued correlated to the health of all Americans. While Wright was installed as director of the Department of Surgery at Harlem Hospital in 1943, Lawrence was drafted into another form of service that exposed him to grave injuries and disease. In October, he began his two-year appointment with the US Coast Guard, then a branch of the Navy. In a recent article, art historian John Ott has brought new critical attention to Lawrence's wartime series of paintings, produced while he was stationed on Coast Guard vessels in 1944 and 1945. While most of the original paintings have been lost, photographs of the artworks in the Coast Guard archives document their range of subject matter, which included medical military personnel and procedures. These images tell us something of Lawrence's experience working on the first racially integrated ships in the Navy. The photographed painting on the screen, for instance, portrays white men as heroic laborers operating with black instruments on a shrouded body. As a subject, it recalls the vision of modern surgery created by Alfred Creamy at Harlem Hospital. And in so doing, it demonstrates that segregation persisted in the so-called integrated space of the naval vessel. Other paintings by Lawrence that survive in the Coast Guard archives tell a different story, showing us that black men had an important role to play in the eradication of disease in World War II. Here we see an African-American sailor in uniform looking through the eyepiece of a microscope. The bacteria, he observes through the lens, are grossly enlarged in a projection above his head, highlighting their significance in military life and death, as well as the significance of the men who helped eradicate them. Supporting this view are the specific shapes of these bacteria, which resemble the microorganisms known to cause syphilis and gonorrhea, the two venereal diseases that plagued the American military in World War II. I actually had medical doctors tell me this, so I know it's right. <laughs> 
This figure should remind you of Virtus Hayes's Pursuit of Happiness mural at the Harlem Hospital, which featured in its all-black medical team an African-American man standing before a microscope and holding a test tube aloft. And I'm referring to this area right here. Serving in the Coast Guard was, it would seem, the first time that Lawrence found himself surrounded daily by medical operations since he had assisted Alston at Harlem Hospital. It became useful in the context of the war to make analogies between what he had, he had observed of race and medicine in Harlem and what he encountered at sea, exploring whether the progress envisioned by the muralists and Louis T. Wright was compatible with the realities of integrated military life. What Lawrence discovered was both disheartening and uplifting. And so the ambivalence that I attributed to his free clinic of 1937 remained prevalent in his reflections on medicine and black life in the 1940s. Not long after his honorable discharge from the military at the end of the war, Lawrence experienced a medical emergency of his own. In 1949, he voluntarily checked himself into a psychiatric hospital in Queens, suffering from clinical depression. The 11 paintings he produced in his nine months at, Har at Hillside Hospital depict the various forms of treatment he received there. And unlike any of his previous artworks, white bodies dominate the scenes. In psychiatric therapy, Lawrence depicted his own doctor at Hillside on the left, who was known for investigating the relationship between art and neurosis. The doctor's empathy and the patient's concentrated introspection are evident in their close-up, carefully outlined features. Between them, we see the doctor's psychiatric tool, a picture of intertwined bodies. Occupational therapy number one represents one of the many work-based therapy work therapies that Hillside offers its patients. Here, five women are busy producing things out of col colorful fabric. While some operate sewing machines, others concentrate on threading needles, knitting, and embroidering. The metaphor is not subtle. These patients are weaving together the pieces of their lives into a vibrant whole, regaining their focus and sense of purpose, one stitch at a time. Responding to an exhibition of the Hillside Hospital paintings in New York in 1950, Ebony Magazine noted that critics found them emotionally richer, technically more advanced, and socially more significant than Lawrence's previous artworks. What critics found most praiseworthy about the paintings was their engagement with European modernism, particularly their recollection of Van Gogh's asylum art and their apparent lack of interest in black struggles. In the hospital series, in other words, critics saw Lawrence as speaking for himself for the first time, and not for his race. Even Lawrence's doctor insisted that the paint paintings, quote, express the healthiest portion of his personality, unquote, meaning that which was not preoccupied with the plight of African Americans. Many believed at the time that the source of, art of the artist's depression was in fact this plight, and not the racism that fueled it. And yet the paintings that Lawrence produced at Hillside challenged such views demonstrating that questions about black agency and health in Harlem were never far from his thoughts. Consider Creative Therapy, the only painting in the hospital series that depicts a black body. Not just any black body, but one working at an easel, just as Lawrence would have done when he produced the Hillside Hospital series. Significantly, we are unable to see what this black figure paints on his canvas. Like the color of his skin, this fact sets him apart from his white subjects. They, we can clearly see, are painting colorful flowers and geometric designs whose colors and patterns resonate with one another. It would not be difficult to see Lawrence as the figure of the African-American artist, working in isolation and with his creative production unseen. The therapies at Hillside encouraged him to acknowledge such feelings of loneliness and despair and to work through them by means of creative production. They further taught him to express a personal vision of the world that stemmed from his unique experiences as an African-American artist whose formative years were spent in Harlem. 
I'd like to think that the therapy Lawrence underwent at Hillside helped make it possible for him to return in 1953 to a subject that had been imprinted on his mind since the age of 20. That subject was Harlem Hospital. We have seen how working with Alston and his team in the late 1930s subtly shaped the medically themed paintings that Lawrence created in the years that followed. But none of his artworks responded as directly to that experience as this painting did. Unequivocally titled Surgery, Harlem Hospital, the work rejects the vision of racial integration that Alston proposed in his modern medicine mural and represents in its place five black men in surgical scrubs. While Lawrence's choice of five members for his surgical, uh, uh, surgical team, their arrangement in relation to the patient, and the color palette in the painting overall have little in common with Alston's murals, they do recall Alfred Creamy's fresco, Modern Surgery and Anesthesia. Indeed, I propose that we read Surgery Harlem Hospital as Lawrence's effort to address the racism of Creamy's vision head on by substituting white with black. The result was an unambivalent vision of modern surgery in Harlem that equated blackness not with things but with professional working bodies. Comparison to the Hillside Hospital paintings allows us to go further in, in interpreting this scene as a kind of creative occupational therapy. Like the white women who found mental and emotional focus through their sewing, these black men train their eyes and hands on the delicate work before them, carefully manipulating their surgical instruments, which protrude like scissors from colorfully patterned fabric. But while the women worked in isolation, each developing her own creative project to ease a troubled mind, the five surgeons in Lawrence's painting operate as a team. Through their cooperative effort to repair and piece together the patient's body, almost certainly a black body, these men heal the wounds that institutional racism inflicted upon them, their community, and their nation. Understanding the profound impact that the Harlem Hospital mural project had on Jacob Lawrence opens up a number of new interpretations of his work. For one thing, it offers a source for his particular fascination, not only with medical subjects, but also with the multi-panel series. For decades, in fact, critics have compared the migration series to the form of the mural. In his epic history of American art, Robert Hughes observed that Lawrence, quote, imagined the migration paintings as integrally, integrally connected, a single work of art, no less unified than a mural, but portable, unquote. More recently, when reviewing MoMA's exhibition of the complete migration series in 2015, which is what you see here, Barry Nemet described the panels as private and public at, at once. They are intimate in inches, yet mural scale in impact. As eager as I am to develop new interpretations of Lawrence's art, I must admit I'm more interested in what happens if we read early African-American modernism through the lens of public health. Looking closely at the artworks and writings of important figures in this movement, we see running through them reflections on medicine and healthcare. Charles Alston, for instance, collaborated with his friend, Louis T. Wright, to produce a series of medical illustrations depicting bodily ailments and injuries, sketches that have yet to receive any scholarly attention. Howard University professor Alain Locke, who championed, championed the art of the New Negro in the 1920s, also turned to medicine in the 1930s as crucial to creating a new Harlem. Writing in the Survey Graphic in 1936, Locke lamented the end of the Harlem Renaissance and its hopeful flourishing of artistic activity. Left in its wake, he explained, was social and civic unrest and the difficult work of reform. In Locke's final recommendations, reforming healthcare at Harlem Hospital topped the list. An illustration in the article noted New York City's pride in the new women's pavilion, whose entrance would soon be flanked by Charles Alston's murals. How did artists of Lawrence's generation read Locke's words, 
published in the same magazine that printed his artistic manifesto, The New Negro, in 1925. Specifically, what of the 25 painters who worked with Alston on the Harlem Hospital mural project? How did they imagine the relationship between public art and public health after the completion of the murals in 1940? Finally, how might we recover the relation, that relationship through creative scholarship now that the murals themselves have been restored and prominently displayed on Lenox Avenue? This is the work I hope to undertake. Thank you very much.